Hey, Grio fam, it's Jaron Keith Gaynor, Managing Editor of Politics and Washington Correspondent at The Grio. And I'm here with FEMA Administrator Deanne Criswell. Administrator, welcome to The Grio. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for having me on today. So you and your team at FEMA have been hard at work over the past few weeks with hurricanes Fiona and uh, Ian in Florida and Puerto Rico. Can you give us an update about what's happening on the ground, especially in Florida, um, and what assistance Florida has been, what FEMA has been providing so far, and what still needs to be done? Absolutely. I, I mean, I think it's a very interesting time because we had Hurricane Fiona, and I'll just start there really quickly. I was there just a couple of weeks before Fiona, checking on the recovery from Maria, and then went back immediately following Fiona so I could make sure that our recovery efforts were still moving on from Maria, and what would we need to do to help um, accelerate the recovery from Fiona so it didn't impact that. So it was a really good visit afterwards. Uh, we have a great team in Puerto Rico that is supporting the recovery efforts and the initial stabilization efforts from Fiona. In fact, the majority of our employees are from Puerto Rico, so they're really invested in the recovery and the stabilization of what's going on over there. And I think that really makes a difference, right? We want to make sure that we are representing the communities that we serve and having the majority of that staff be from Puerto Rico has made a big difference. Hurricane Ian happened just on the heels of that, um, and we saw, you know, a category four, pretty close to a category five hurricane make landfall on the western coast of Florida, but it left a path across the entire state. Also made a turn and had some impacts to South Carolina, but really the majority of the, the impacts are on that western coast with a lot of water and wind damage but also in the center part of the state with a lot of water damage. In fact, many communities are still um, waiting for waters to recede so they can get into their homes. Um, a little bit about what we did for Hurricane Ian is we knew that this was gonna be a large event. We knew it was gonna impact a large population and we knew that there was a lot of vulnerable communities across Florida, um, a lot of underserved communities, but also an elderly population. And we wanted to make sure that if people didn't get out of harm's way, that we were gonna be able to go in and do those initial life safety actions. And so we assembled the largest search and rescue footprint across the federal government than we ever have to be in place and position before landfall. And they just melded right in with the state and the local teams to make sure that as soon as it was safe, they were able to go in and start those life-saving actions. As we're looking at the recovery, I mean, it's catastrophic. I think you've covered some of this and, and you've seen the images on television, communities that are, are gonna have a very long and difficult road to recovery. And so we're bringing in the right people. They've been there already to talk with the state and talk with the local communities about what does recovery look like? What are we gonna have to do to help rebuild these communities and get resources to those that have some who have lost everything. So we have thousands of people that are supporting the efforts right now in Florida. We have people that are going out into the neighborhoods talking to people so we can hear from them firsthand, you know, what their impacts are and what their potential needs will be. And as we've seen with Hurricane Katrina years ago, uh, when natural disasters hit communities, Black communities are often hurt the most. Can you talk to us about how FEMA is ensuring that the assistance that they're providing is being done equitably? Yeah, we've learned a lot over the, the past several years. I think from Hurricane Katrina, one of the things we learned is being able to respond quickly and get into those impacted communities to make sure that we're getting people out of harm's way. You know, we learned more following hurricanes like Harvey, Irma, and Maria, as well as that there are communities that just have barriers to accessing our assistance. And so we made some policy changes last year to change or remove, I should say, some of the barriers that individuals and families had, like expanding the type of documentation that we accept to prove home, home ownership or occupancy. We've seen a lot of um, more families that have been eligible for assistance because of one small policy change uh, than we have in many years before. And we're continuing to look at the things that we can do to remove those barriers that we know many of these disadvantaged communities have to accessing the type of assistance FEMA or our federal partners bring in. Yeah, that's so important. And actually just weeks before uh, these back-to-back -back hurricanes, FEMA had a campaign called the Ready Campaign uh, to ensure that black households are prepared for natural disasters as we're seeing more of them due to climate change. Can you tell us more about this campaign and why it's so yeah. important? 
I am so excited about this campaign. This is our second year of doing what we would call a culturally competent campaign. Uh, last year, uh, we did a campaign to reach out to the Latino community. And what we saw was a significant increase in the traffic to our ready.gov website or our listos.gov website to download information on how they can receive or how they can protect their families. We brought in the community members, right? We brought in people of the, of the Latino um, culture to help us understand how do we reach out to them? How do we make sure that the messages that we're sending are relatable so they take the actions to protect their families. And so this year, um, protecting your legacy was the theme. And it, we did the same process. We reached out to community members and asked them, what, what are the messages that would help you make the decisions that you need to, to plan and prepare to protect your family? And so we were very excited uh, to launch this year's campaign. And as we go through the year, we'll see what the, um, the results are and we see what the impact might be as we get data throughout the year on this. And another concern um, in Florida in particular um, is flood insurance. Many of the victims did not have flood insurance. And for those who do, uh, there's been reports that it's not enough to cover the cost of uh, the damage. Um, what has FEMA been doing to address that issue? And does this bring attention to an issue that many people should know about in, in wanting to ensure that they have flood insurance to prevent this from uh, pre prevent not being able to cover uh, the cost for recovery? Yeah, insurance, uh, it's a very complicated industry, right? We have flood insurance, we have wind insurance, we have all kinds of specialty insurances, you have renter's insurance. And we know that after events like this, we have a large number of people that do have insurance, but often they are underinsured for some of the things that um, have received damage. Um, or many people don't have insurance at all because it perhaps is unaffordable for them or they didn't think they needed it. And that's the piece, you know, that I want to be able to get that message out when we're talking about flood insurance. A lot of people think only if you live in a special hazard area that requires it, that you should buy it. But I will tell you that no matter where you are, look at what we just saw in Kentucky recently with the flash flooding there or St. Louis with the flash flooding that we had there. These rivers can rise fast. And so just because you're not in an area that mandates it doesn't mean that you shouldn't have it because insurance is that number one line of defense to help get people back on their feet after they um, have been impacted by a severe weather event. And this might be a little bit out of your scope, but there's been reports of concerns that uh, because of uh, the impact of Hurricane Ian, that voting in Florida could be impacted. Precincts um, are now uh, potentially not going to be open. Uh, is there, are there conversations being had in administration uh, around this issue? You know, where FEMA's role comes in is making sure we're supporting the state and the local jurisdictions to restore their critical services. Um, and if a community has had an impact and the state requests assistance, we certainly can come in and support them. Um, but it's not our place to go in and, and um, uh, add capacity unless it's requested by the state or the local jurisdiction first. But we certainly can um, if there was an impact that the state has uh, asked for additional resources. And Administrator, any final thoughts uh, to Black communities as uh, FEMA uh, deals with the aftermath of hurricanes Fiona and Ian, what should Black communities be thinking about um, as we unfortunately know there will be more natural disasters? Yeah, I think I would say a couple of things. One, uh, this is going to be a very long and complicated recovery. Uh, we have a lot of staff that are out in the field, and we know that there's been a lot of people impacted, and we are working to make sure that we address all of the needs that are out there. I even have my uh, director for faith-based and community engagement out there, Marcus Coleman. He's been on the ground since right after the storm passed to talk with faith-based organizations to find out what the needs are. And so we, we're really doing a, a strong campaign to figure out where the needs are and we can get the resources in there. I think as we think about the future, the one thing that I would ask is people just need to understand what their future risk might be. Uh, we're seeing an increase in the types of um, severe events. They're um, materializing more rapidly. They're causing more destruction. And so as communities or as individuals start to rebuild, you know, how can we rebuild in a way that's going to make them more resilient against future um, severe weather events? And so those are the kind of decisions that families are going to have to make right now. Well, the work that you are doing at FEMA is so important. And I thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for helping me get the message out. Absolutely. Take care.